I never imagined um, Forest Church being paired with uh, being paired with Simon and Garfunkel before. Although it kind of kind of works. There's this um, New Yorker cartoon I saw once um, many many years ago. It uh, but it stays it stays with me. In the in the cartoon, a minister stands in the pulpit and says. For those of you who may be thinking about sinning, this is a preemptive sermon. <laughs> My message this morning is not, is not about sin, um, but it's kind of, sort of, a preemptive sermon. My message this morning is, is about the, the essence, the heart and the soul of, of liberal religion, um, what, what it is. And the title that I gave you was the very definition of liberal. But this morning, I'm, I'm more interested in one particular aspect, one particular understanding of liberalism, the definition that equates liberalism with generosity. As Forrest Church puts it in the reading we just heard from, who is the most famous liberal of all, it simply has to be God. No one is more generous. Liberalism equated with generosity. And so in preaching about generosity this morning, I want to own that I am breaking a rule, um, a cultural norm, a, a rule that exists within Unitarian Universalist churches that says that the minister is only allowed to preach about generosity once per year, and it has to be in March. And if I'm doing that, I have to give everyone sufficient notice that that's what I plan to do so that those who wish not to attend can come up with an excuse to be absent on that Sunday. <laughs> Thus my joke that this is a preemptive sermon. See, This morning I want to talk about generosity. And there's a couple of reasons I'm doing this. Um, one reason is that at this time that we're in right now this this season from from mid November from mid November perhaps until you know a week from Thursday or maybe a little bit longer maybe in to early December or maybe maybe if we do it really well all through December this is a time in our culture that is set aside for gratitude and thanksgiving and that feeling of being grateful. It's a time of celebrating the harvest, of feasting, of images of abundance. It's a time of charity and of counting and acknowledging our blessings. So if we're, if we're doing it right at this time of the year, we're aware of blessings in our lives and it seems to me that gratitude and generosity are really different sides of the same coin, that one can't flourish and thrive without the other. There is nothing we can think of for which we are thankful, nothing we can think of for which we are grateful, that is not tied intimately to a sense of generosity, either in the, comic, the cosmic sense of a divine generosity that Forest Church spoke of, spoke of, or the generosity that comes when other people, others in our lives, share generously their love and their affection and their lives with us. I believe that if our gratitude is true, we will inevitably respond to this gratitude with expressions of generosity. There's also another reason that I've chosen to talk about generosity on this Sunday. Generosity has been on my mind recently and has been something that I've been spending a lot of time sort of thinking about, getting my, wrapping my mind about, because lately I have been meeting intensively with the core leadership group of this year's stewardship committee as they begin preparations for this spring stewardship campaign in March. Um, the team includes Mary Hewlett, Dorothy Hammett, Becky Wabel, and Andrew Hennessy. Um, a group of leaders who have already been very, very generous with their time. 
And I have been having all of these planning meetings and planning conversations and discussions with them. Um, and I have to tell you they, that uh, Mary, Dorothy, and Becky were all at the first service, and, and none of them actually said that, that I wasn't welcome to participate from now on after they heard me speak. So, so I, got, I got their endorsement, uh, I think, unless, they, unless they're all meeting somewhere else right now, <laughs> planning what to do. This morning's sermon is about generosity, it's about the very definition of liberality, but, and this is important, there isn't actually an ask that I'm making right now. So if you've been feeling kind of on edge, I'm not really asking you for anything right now. That's, that's actually only, only partially true. The only thing I'm gonna ask of you is that you keep an open mind, a liberal mind, and that you allow this message to marinate in your thoughts over the coming months. See what happens with that. I guess the other thing that I would ask is that, is that if you, I guess if you like it to let it marinate, if you, if you don't like my message this morning, the thing I'm going to ask you to do is to, to generously forget everything I'm going to say this morning. <laughs> so that's all the ask that there is. So we can kind of breathe a deep breath and be, and be kind of okay with being here. This is a different approach. It's a different approach because the usual approach to generosity, in, if not in life in general, but certainly in the churches that I've been a part of, is often so miserable, or at least my experience has been miserable. Generosity is a, is a good thing, and yet it seems to be a theological fail when, when generosity is turned into a doleful and pained thing. And here, at least in my own experience, has been kind of how stewardship has been approached in Unitarian Universalist churches. This is, you may not be your own experience, but it's been mine. On some Sunday in March, we were supposed to hold something called Stewardship Sunday. Of course, we try to disguise that by calling it Generosity Sunday or, or Celebration Sunday or what have you. We imagine that when everyone comes to church that Sunday, we'll give them a pledge form when they walk in the door. And by the way, everybody will come on that Sunday because we'll tell them that it is an important Sunday and that they're supposed to come. And we'll expect that everyone, even those people who only come once or twice per year, will show up on Stewardship Sunday, even though if we look at the attendance records going back, it'll show us that, that attendance actually craters on Stewardship Sunday. <laughs> and only the most stalwart and habitual churchgoers actually darken the doorsteps that day. <laughs> then in our, in our minds, we'll give everyone a pledge form when they walk in the door, and we'll have a worship service, and the minister will preach a 20-minute sermon that is intended to be so powerful and profound that everyone will be so moved that they'll double or triple their pledge on the spot, <laughs> which is not at all a lot of pressure on me. And this reflects, by the way, the way in which we all make financial decisions in our family, right? This is kind of like spur of, spur of the moment inspiration. And then at the end of the service, everyone will turn in their pledge cards and will have 100% participation and will not only reach our goal but shatter it. And the stewardship drive will be over, which means we won't hear anything more on that topic for 52 Sundays. That's how it works here, right? Yeah. That's... <laughs> I've got my, own, got my own laugh track behind me. It's awesome. Um, so what I want to do this morning is say a few words about a theology of abundance and a few words about a theology of generosity and also offer a few comments about my philosophy of stewardship that are tied directly to this theology of abundance. As Unitarian Universalists, we practice a form of liberal religion. That's, that's what we do. The history of this congregation is that we haven't always been Unitarian Universalist, but we've always been a liberal religious institution. The founding documents of our church from 1953 attest to that spirit. Those documents said, Chapel Hill needs a worshiping and working fellowship of people from varied backgrounds and faiths, a church of open membership, free from denominational limitations, a spiritual home wherein there is unity in the Christian essentials, liberty in the non-essentials, and charity 
in all things. I love that description of our congregation's origins, don't you? That's a neat, neat document. So what exactly do I mean by liberal religion anyways? In one sense, liberality has to do with freedom and with openness. Unitarian historian Earl Morris Wilbur once characterized liberal religion as being committed to freedom, reason, and tolerance. And the word liberal is connected to the words liberation and liberty. It's connected to this idea of freedom and openness. And we see that freedom and openness in the description of our congregation with varied backgrounds, open membership, free from denominational limitations, liberty. Liberal religion is free religion. As one of our hymns puts it, we are, quote, free from the ties that bind the mind to narrow thought or lifeless creed, free from a social code that fails to serve the cause of human need. But liberal religion isn't just free religion. The definition of liberal is not just free. There's another meaning to the word liberal. When you look up the word liberal in the dictionary, it provides the following as one of the valid definitions for the word liberal. Quote, giving and generous in temperament or behavior. And the dictionary provides the following synonyms for liberal. Beneficent, charitable, open-handed, munificent, unstinting, lavish, see generous. It's like Forrest Church consulted with the dictionary when he wrote his sermon that, um, that Ruth led, read from before. A thesaurus I consulted added the following words and phrases for liberal, including abounding, ample, bounteous, bountiful, plenteous, profuse, plate is full, cup runs over, and my favorite, Mucho. <laughs> I like that we could call it liberal religion or mucho religion. What I'm point I'm trying to make is that is that liberal religion is is, is this idea, this this definition, the very definition of liberal is circumscribed by an idea of both freedom and also generosity. The freedom comes in freedom from creeds and freedom from the dictates of religious hierarchy. Freedom comes in freedom to explore, openness to different understandings and traditions, and the freedom to follow the dictates of one's own conscience. But liberal religion, I want to argue, is also generous religion at its core. Liberal religion has understood God as generous, has understood existence as abundant, has understood the world as plentiful. Moreover, liberal religion has understood that this world is worthy of our respect and reverence and that our proper reaction to such generosity is not only an abiding sense of gratitude for, for us to respond out of a sense of generosity in our own lives. My theology of generosity is simply this. The cosmos has been generous with us. Our proper response is to be generous in turn. How does that definition work? Does that sound, does that sound good? Does that sound horrible? With that sort of idea, who among us, who among us would not want to be generous? Is there anybody here who who's wakes up in the morning or, or is going to walk out of here today saying, you know what, I have decided that my goal in life is to be less generous. If that's you, don't, don't, no show of hands, all right? I don't want to, I don't want to see it. Somebody, somebody looked like they were going to put up their hand at the first service and I... So that's all kind of, kind of like aspire to, to generosity, right? That's, that's what we do in... In life, so why then? Why then? It's interesting. So why then, if it's if it's kind of good and we like it and we aspire to it, why is it so very very hard to talk about? Why is it something that we 
that we dread or that, that some of us dread, that many of us dread? I find that really curious. I've, I've been reflecting on that question of why it is that, that we as a people, as a community, as a group of individuals, all say that we aspire to generosity, that that's one of the, that's a value that we would, we would seek to claim for our own life, and yet at the same time would be really, really kind of turned off avoidant if the minister comes out and writes, say, we're going to talk about generosity this Sunday. So people would like, oh, I think I've got, you know, I think I've got to brush my, my pet's teeth this morning instead of going to church. <laughs> and so I want to tell you, I want to kind of, kind of do a little confession here. Um, so I've been meeting with the stewardship team and, and kind of reflecting on this. And, and I want to tell you what, what, how I used to approach it. And, um, and that may not be, have been the most, the most effective way. So I used to believe that it was the role of the minister to stand in front and to kind of model this extreme generosity and to kind of to kind of like get up there and, and do it and then say like look at me I'm doing it it's not that bad and so what I used to do is I would get up there and I would sort of talk about you know what I gave to charity that year and what I gave to the church and, and what percentage of income that was. And, and one year, I actually, I actually went back and looked at old stewardship sermons because um, I was trying to figure, figure them out. And, and one year, I actually caught myself saying, talking about how it was, my, it was my goal to, in my lifetime, give away a million dollars. And that was my, that was my goal. And then, I, and then I laid out my like, theory of how I was going to do that. Um, and, and I used to believe that if I modeled it with my own being, that it would inspire everybody else to do likewise. Um, that didn't always quite work. And so I was, I was wondering, I was wondering sort of like, did, did they, did they not hear me? Maybe I needed to do. Maybe I needed to do even even more. And so the next year I do even more. And the next year I do even more. And um, and it was really interesting. And then I ran across a, a a sort of a quote that that hinted at why this approach may actually not have worked. Ed Friedman, who is a famous psychologist of of organizational systems, especially church systems, Ed Friedman said, the colossal misunderstanding of our time is the assumption that insight is effective in influencing behavior. Let me read that again. The colossal misunderstanding of our time is the assumption that insight is effective in influencing behavior. Kind of a scary thought, isn't it? Then Friedman goes on and says, people can only hear you when they are moving toward you. And they are not likely to hear you when your words are pursuing them. <laughs> the colossal misunderstanding of our time is the assumption that insight is effective in influencing behavior. People can only hear you when they are moving toward you. And they are not likely to hear you when your words are pursuing them. Which means a different approach. And this year, by the way, I will be, you know, no less generous than I have been at any other time in my life. But that's an interesting perspective to put. Um, so. I came to a conclusion about, about how church's message around generosity and around, around stuff like that. And 
it's actually a bit counterintuitive, but it is to begin with the simple, simple saying, the simple, simple idea that the church is actually not, is actually not at all entitled to anyone's gifts. Not entitled to anyone's gifts. Because the second there is this moment where we say we're actually entitled to a specific average dollar amount, a specific percentage, a specific level of giving, then that precludes the opportunity for both generosity and gratitude because they are different sides to the same coin. But to put it actually, not being owed anything, it simply is all generosity and all gratitude. All generosity and all gratitude. If we actually are, are thankful for something, we can't have a sense that we're owed it, right? The sense that, imagine, imagine getting a birthday present, right? You'd say, thank you, unless you feel like you're owed a birthday present, in which case there's, there's no opportunity for gratitude. And that person wasn't being generous in getting you a present. They were merely, merely fulfilling an obligation. And you, in turn, are not moved to be generous in your own being. It's a stopping point. Oh, I've received what I'm owed. Sounds good. So that is my thought, that, that gratitude and generosity are simply two sides of the same coin. That the moment we actually become aware that we're grateful for something, that that indicates that something or someone, the universe, a neighbor, a friend, a family member, that someone has been generous to us and we become inspired ourselves to reach out and become more generous as a response to our own gratitude. At least that's the formulation that I'm playing with these days. And I invite you to test it. Not in March, but in this season, in this season of Thanksgiving, when we're asked to recognize all in life that we are grateful for, to count and to be aware of our blessings. I invite you to count those blessings, to give thanks, and to see if in turn you are motivated towards generosity. If so, keep it up till March. If not, forget that I've said any of this. Be generous in your forgetting. Thank you and amen.